Good morning, everyone. It's really my pleasure to welcome all of you to our first virtual Agriculture Awareness Day in Manitoba. As many of you who have participated in this day know, this is an opportunity to celebrate and to celebrate many things, particularly the significant contributions of our agriculture industry to our province. It was in 2005 that Manitoba passed a unanimous all-party resolution to create this day, to create a special time in our calendar to promote the contributions that this great industry makes to the province and how it has become a key economic driver of our economy. Then in 2014, we rocked a bow around this and proclaimed the Food and Farm Awareness Week, which formalized making Agriculture Awareness Day the third Tuesday in March. This event really is a wonderful opportunity to create awareness about the extraordinary work that is taking a place across many sectors to the far reaches of our province. Stating the obvious, COVID-19 meant this year's event is virtual. However, much more significant than its impact on this event, the pandemic has been a significant disruptor worldwide, affecting every industry, including agriculture and food. But our industries quickly adapted the people quickly knew what it needed to take to get it done. And then the, the province experienced little to no interruption in food being available. Again, speaking volumes to the nimbleness and the ingenuity of our province. For this year, we always pick a theme. This year's theme is protein and the emerging agriculture technology. And so we're going to spend a bit of time celebrating and highlighting some of those highlights that our industry has embraced. However, to start off the officialness of Agriculture Awareness Day, it really is my pleasure to be able to introduce the Premier of Manitoba, the Honourable Brian Pallister. I'm Brian Pallister, Premier of Manitoba. It's an honor to join you today. I am pleased to be celebrating Agriculture Awareness Day 2021 with you as the uh, great grandson of an immigrant farmer, a uh, grandson of a farmer, a uh, son of a farmer, brother of a farmer, uncle of a farmer, you get it. Proud to be part of a fifth, what is now a fifth generation, we hope will be a sixth, seventh and eighth generation family uh, ag business. We understand uh, how important, all of us on this call understand how important agriculture is to the province of Manitoba and always will be. Uh, I'm a 4-H'er I'm a who understands the importance of agriculture. I might be the first premier in 50 years that understands which end of the cow the hay actually goes in. And I hope I'm not the last because agriculture will remain one of the absolute keys to Manitoba's future, as well as it is a key to our present presently um, it's our pro one of our province's leading industries. Ag uh, generates about $6 billion in cash receipts on an annual basis, and our food processing sector is about a quarter of all the goods that are manufactured in Manitoba. When you consider agri-food and agriculture together, you're talking about over 33,000 Manitobans that are employed in the industry. Now, this keeps our economy strong, and it's gonna make our economy stronger. Since the release of our protein strategy, just a couple of years ago, Manitoba's attracted more than $680 million in protein investments and 600 new jobs, and there's much more to come. As attracting capital is the key to growing our economy, our ag sector and the value that we can add to our products is going to be key going forward as it has been. Since we became government, this has been three out of four dollars that have been added to Manitoba in investment have been because of the ag sector. We're well positioned to be North America's protein supplier of choice 
and the sustainable protein industry growth is a key to that. And we recognize and appreciate there are many other opportunities as well throughout the agricultural industry for our job creation, but also for our communities and for the families of this province. And so to all farmers, I say this, thank you. Thank you for the important role you play in Manitoba's economy. Thank you for the stewardship of our environment, of our lands, of our resources. Thank you for your consideration, the operations of your businesses, not only of today, but of sustainability for future generations as well. Thank you for helping build a, a better, and I believe a brighter future for Manitobans. I want you to know that our government is dedicated to you and dedicated to your industry because we understand when farmers do well, Manitoba does well too. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. You certainly are one of the loudest cheerleaders of our industry. It's my pleasure now to introduce the Honorable Blaine Peterson, who is our Minister of Agriculture and Resource Development. Minister Peterson. Today is Ag Awareness Day. We take this opportunity to celebrate the women and men who work hard every day to produce safe and high quality food while respecting our environment and our animals. The farm families and organizations involved in primary agriculture and food processing strive to build on the opportunities and advantages that come with a growing demand for food. As the Premier noted, one of the strengths in our industry is protein. This strength underpins this year's theme, protein and emerging agricultural technology. We celebrate the innovation in agriculture, highlighting plant and animal protein production and the processing taking place in Manitoba, which sets the stage for future opportunities. The successful protein summit held in February the appointment of Dr. James House from the Unit of M for Research Priorities and a Protein Research Symposium to be held this summer are just a few of the highlights of the Manitoba Protein Strategy. We also want to acknowledge other programs the farm community has embraced with enthusiasm. Our watershed districts are doing innovative work with the Grow and Conservation Trusts, Best management practices, or as they're known in the industry as BMPs, enable farmers to make improvements to their land while enhancing the environment. Today's agricultural industry is technologically advanced. Agriculture and resource development's new service centers are designed to meet the research and capacity needs for our client base. Farm safety is of the utmost importance. We encourage all farm families to think safety as a busy spring season approaches. Thank you to everyone involved in this dynamic industry. Thank you also to the farm community for your generous donations to food banks, especially in the early days of the pandemic. Agriculture has remained a bright spot in an uncertain world, and together we look forward to even brighter days for agriculture in Manitoba. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, Minister Peterson. It's really a pleasure to have you as our minister, and certainly you work extremely hard every day on behalf of the industry. Next, I would like to introduce to you the leader of the official opposition, Rob Canoe. Mr. Canoe? Hi, I'm Wab Kanu, leader of the Manitoba NDP caucus and leader of the official opposition in Manitoba. Now our team, we fully recognize the important role that agriculture plays to the provincial economy. And of course, also as a backbone to so many families and communities right across Manitoba. That's why we uplift and celebrate this year's theme for Ag Awareness Day, which focuses on protein. There's been a lot of attention paid to plant-based protein recently and with good reason. 
it may really help Manitoba to be a leader globally for generations to come. It helps us tap into those markets where consumers want to have food that helps us achieve our climate goals and who also just desire to know what is in the food that we eat. Now at the same time, all of those ranchers out there, those who we may say are producers of animal-based protein, to use the lingo of the day, are still going to play a very, very important part of our provincial economy and ag sector for generations to come. And let's face it, having a barbecue, that's still some of the best eaten around. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the young farmers and others who are practicing regenerative ag. Now, to me, this is a very exciting uh, field in the industry, which on the one hand has cutting edge, groundbreaking new techniques, but on the other hand, also focuses in some ways on a return tra to tradition. And in either eventuality, this is a way to ensure that ag practices are sustainable for the water, air, and land for generations to come. And so our family, on a personal level, we like to support by ordering direct from farm from a regenerative ag producer in southwestern Manitoba. So however you fit in to the protein sector of the agricultural industry or however you participate in the agricultural industry as a whole, our team wants to take this time to wish you a happy Ag Awareness Day. Thank you so much. Miigwech and merci. Thanks, Mr. Knu. It was a pleasure having you join us today. Next speaker is the leader of the Liberal Party, Mr. Dougal Lamont. Mr. Lamont? Hi, everyone. My name is Dougal Lamont. I'm leader of the Manitoba Liberal Party and MLA for St. Boniface, and it is a, a real honor uh, today to be uh, asked to participate in Ag Awareness Days. Um, look, I have a, a an appreciation uh, for the importance of agriculture, but also uh, for innovation. Uh, my dad grew up on a farm in Headingley. Uh, he and my uncle and my grandfather farmed uh, near Gladstone. Uh, we still have a quarter section up near Rossburn. And uh, there are a couple of things that I really want to emphasize, and it's really exciting to me actually, that uh, we're not just talking about ag, we're talking about innovation, because one of my prized possessions, this is, it took me a long time to find this, um, this is a little vial of marquee wheat. These are the seeds, the actual seeds of the wheat that made it possible for us to grow wheat in Canada and in Manitoba. And they were developed at the experimental farm in Ottawa. And because they could be harvested two weeks earlier or 10 days earlier than anywhere else, it meant that we could all of a sudden have ripe crops before the frost. And that development from a single seed ended up uh, making it possible for people to have successful farms in the West. It has made farmers lots of money. It's made lots of people billions of dollars over the years. And that, that connection between innovation and agriculture is, in, is essential. Without agriculture, we, uh, we, we can't survive. Uh, but without innovation, there is no agriculture. And we have an incredible history of it here in Manitoba with Balder Stephenson, who developed canola at the University of Manitoba, uh, Triticale, the list goes on. And I know uh, part of it is that um, when it comes to agriculture, we are in a uh, kind of an arms race against nature, whether it's rust or insects or some other kind of uh, species or just dealing with uh, changes in climate. These are incredibly important uh, incredibly important issues you know without agriculture we don't eat uh, and I recognize which everyone should is that agriculture has always been a uniquely risky proposition um, and because you don't control the weather you have so many things that are in your control and so many things that are out of your control as a farmer that uh, that just don't apply to any other industry it's unique it's uh, vital we can't do without it any more than we can do without water so I want to thank you so much uh, for your work, for your innovation, for your passion. Uh, just to let you know, the Manitoba Liberals absolutely support you in what you're doing. Uh, and we want to make sure that, uh, that 
agriculture and innovation and rural communities thrive because if you don't thrive, we don't either. Thank you so much, everybody. Merci. Thank you to Mr. Lamont for joining us for today's Agriculture Awareness Day. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce one of the newest members of our agriculture business community here in Manitoba, and that's Dominic Botman, the CEO of Roquette Canada. Dominic is the CEO of Roquette, a global leader in plant-based protein and a pioneer of plant proteins for food, nutrition, and the health markets. Welcome, Dominic. Good morning. On behalf of Rocket, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to speak today at the Agricultural Awareness Day. Actually, what we're talking about today, a protein and emerging agricultural technology, fits very well what we're doing at Rocket. Um, at Rocket, we unlock the potential of nature uh, using raw materials from plants and uh, working with our customers and partners. We're developing new ingredients and new excipients to better feed and also cure people. Manitoba has a great opportunity in front of it. The demand for plant-based protein is growing. It's linked with the fact that by 2050, we will be about 10 billion people on the planet. And we need to feed all these people. By 2054, it is expected that one third of all the protein supply will be plant-based. And P is playing a big role of this is expected to be the top growing protein within the plant-based protein. We have invested at Rocket more than half a billion euros in pea protein over the last five years. First with the plants in, uh, in, in Europe, and now in Manitoba, we're investing more than $600 million to build the largest pea protein plant in the world. We're working with partners like uh, Peak Industry Canada and um, are trying to, uh, to attract and become the, the major anchor to create um, an ecosystem here in Portage with a lot of partners around our plant. Why did we pick Manitoba? First, we need obviously uh, skilled labor. And uh, when I first moved from, uh, from Singapore, actually, to Manitoba, I was a little bit worried that we wouldn't find the uh, skilled labor. And, and very quickly, uh, going to colleges and uh, meeting people, found out the skilled labor was not going to be an issue. We've been able to hire more than 100 people within a year and uh, are ready to start up the plant with this amazing team. Second, we obviously need fees. That's the second reason uh, we came to Manitoba. Um, and here again, we had a very good welcome from the farmers who are looking forward and who are very no innovative. Uh, we thought that actually uh, we would get our peas mainly from uh, Saskatchewan, but uh, today we have 70% of our peas coming from Manitoba and only 30% coming from Saskatchewan. Then because peas and plant-based protein is linked with sustainability, uh, we wanted to locate in an area where we could have sustainable hydroelectric uh, generation and Manitoba is, is the place to be from that standpoint. Last but not least, uh, most of the value-added products we're going to make from peas will be shipped to the US, but also to Asia and maybe Europe. So we needed also a local uh, and a central location in Canada with good connectivity. And Manitoba has road connections, but also rail connections to ship product to Asia, but also ship product to the US. Those are our partners. And um, in November, we received our first pea supply and pea truck it was from a farmer, uh, Gord, which is uh, west of Portage. And uh, we celebrated this together, uh, offering him a jersey as he was the first farmer to deliver peas to us. I wish 
we didn't have COVID and we could uh, have invited other farmers. We're working with more than 400 farmers. And um, one day, once the pandemic is over, we'll be able to invite them to the plant and show them what we're doing with the peas. We have a capacity of 125,000 tons of peas, which we will process uh, annually. And we're just announced that we're going to make some organic pea protein. So we're contracting with farmers. And again, it's going very well uh, with farmers from Manitoba, uh, farmers from Saskatchewan. We have really the opportunity here in Manitoba to, to build what I call the Silicon Valley of plant-based protein production. It will create hundreds of jobs. Uh, we actually have been approached by companies, more than 10 companies uh, so far, to, uh, to locate next to us. Because we're not making just pea protein, we're making starches, we're making other co-products, which are used for animal feed, for farming, and uh, our goal is to uh, create a circular economy here in Manitoba. This is a great opportunity for Manitoba, and working together with uh, governments, with universities, with, with par private partners um, and consortiums, we am sure we will be successful to attract other businesses and become the Silicon Valley of plant-based protein in Manitoba. Thanks, Dominic. It certainly is a pleasure to have Roquette join us uh, here in Manitoba, and we look forward to uh, any amazing things happening uh, in the protein industry. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Ray Bouchard. Uh, Ray is the CEO, uh, president of Enns Brothers. He's also the board chair of uh, EMILY, the Enterprise Management Intelligence and Learning Initiative. Ray's been in the ag sector for over 35 years, and certainly it's our pleasure to welcome Ray today. Ray? Good morning. It's great to be with you today for Ag Awareness Day. I'm Ray Bouchard, President and CEO of Enns Brothers, and Chair of the Board for EMILY here in Manitoba. Before I get started, I want to recognize the great audience that we have joining us today especially Premier Pallister, Minister Peterson, and other members of the legislature who have joined us this morning. The agri-food industry is a driving force in Manitoba's economy, and I'm happy to share my perspective on protein and emerging ag technology this morning, alongside Dominic Bauman and Brooks White. Agriculture is a central part of Manitoba's economy. No matter who you are or what you do, the agri-food industry has an impact on how we live, what we eat, and the prosperity of our province. The government of Manitoba estimates that primary agriculture alone accounts for 7% of Manitoba's GDP. And that doesn't include value-added processing, food manufacturing, or any of the other critical activities that are linked to the much larger agri-food value chain. In Manitoba, the agri-food industry is something that touches sectors and engages people right across the province, from farmers, plant breeders, crop input retailers, to software developers, researchers, and educators. Everyone involved has an important role to play in the continued success of our sector. It's an exciting time to be involved in the agri-food industry. The next 10 years will create a lot of change caused by new technologies and changing markets. This is a big opportunity. And if we can seize it by making the right investments of time, effort, and of course, capital, the Manitoba agri-food industry will continue to be a global leader. And as the industry continues to evolve, we can achieve the ambitious goal set out by the province to be a world leader and supplier of choice for sustainable protein, both plant and animal. Right now, we are in a moment where we can align ambition and resources to seize this opportunity and punch above our weight in the agri-food industry and sustainable plant and animal protein. 
I'm very fortunate to have a few different perspectives on the road ahead from my work at Enns Brothers, with Emily, and as a founding board director of Protein Industries Canada. Enns Brothers has been selling equipment in Manitoba since 1953. And over this time, there has been a lot of changes in the way we do business, the support we offer to our customers, and on-farm production ag practices. More recently, the convergence of equipment, technology, agronomy, and data has facilitated an evolution in production agriculture. This began in about 20, 2010, but the full impact of the opportunity is really just starting to be realized, and we expect this trend to grow exponentially. Today's equipment and software allows growers to move from farming at the field level to farming at the plant level. To a great degree, this technology already exists today and its wider adoption is a significant opportunity to optimize production and input decisions, reduce the carbon footprint of production and improve profitability and sustainability. This digital revolution happening on farm isn't driven by advancements in technology alone. Our customers, the innovative growers here in Manitoba want more insights and are looking for trusted advisors to help guide them. New technology finding its way on farm is exciting, but also brings with it a lot of complexity. To make the most of it, you need good data collection, data integration, and data management to make it work with existing production systems. Growers already have so much on their plate, so we are privileged to work closely with them as trusted advisors to extract those insights and optimize their business behaviors. As a result, Enns Brothers has become a one-stop shop offering not just equipment, but also technology and agronomy solutions. Agri-food data produced on farm and throughout the value chain is quickly becoming the fuel that will drive technological change in agriculture. Data is the fuel and we will need increasingly powerful tools to put it to work for us, optimize our insights and grow the digital ag ecosystem in Manitoba and across the prairies. Emily is an industry led group focused on, do on doing just that growing the digital ag ecosystem here in Manitoba. Emily works to accelerate the adoption of new technology in our agri-food sector by working with companies, researchers, educators, and innovators. Emily works across four strategic pillars, innovation and research, working with leading edge researchers, intelligent technology integration, supporting SMEs and legacy companies, considering how to integrate new technologies to accelerate their work, skills training and talent development, collaborating with academia and the post-secondary sector to understand the changing nature of work and future skills requirements for our agri-food industry. And finally, capital enablement. On this pillar, Emily has recently announced a partnership with BioEnterprise to support startup and scale-ups with access to resources, mentors, and capital here in Manitoba. While Enns Brothers gave me a direct connection to the everyday work going on at the farm level, I believe in the work Emily is doing because as an industry-led group, it is an important way to invest in building the capacity of the agri-food sector in Manitoba to seize the opportunities presented by new technology. Over the past few months, we have also started working on a new initiative that will address issues raised by the increasing use of data in agri-food. As I mentioned earlier, new data intensive technology is a huge opportunity, but with it come a number of important issues such as data privacy and interoperability. Developing a strong and responsible approach to data management or data stewardship for Canadian agriculture will be foundational and ensure that everyone across the value chain is able to benefit 
from the increasing use of data. Thinking just about growers for a minute, we need to ensure that they have information and tools available to recognize the value present in their data and are able to use it to grow their bottom line. At the same time, it is important that growers have the data literacy, literacy skills to manage the associated risks such as cybersecurity, data privacy. We are still working on getting this off the ground, but we will have a lot more to say about this in the very near future. Considering the changing nature of work and future skills required in digital agriculture, Emily is co-host of Manitoba's Digital Ag Table, a group of 40 industry and academic leaders in Manitoba working together to identify opportunities and address gaps in digital agriculture. This group recognizes the potential we have in this province and is working together to ensure that we can attain it. Ensuring that we have people in our province with the right mix of skills will be imperative to our continued success. One way we are doing this is through a suite of programming focused on developing the skills and talent required to ensure that the agri-food sector in Manitoba has the human resources it needs. This includes engaging people, especially young people from outside of the sector, so they are aware of the great career opportunities available to them and ensuring that new entrants are able to access the training and early career experiences that they need. At the same time, Emily is also working with people already in the agri-food sector so they can maintain and sharpen their skills to remain on the cutting edge. Continuous training and reskilling is an important way to respond to the rapid change in our sector and rapid adoption of new technologies. In conclusion, I hope I have conveyed my optimism for the future of the agri-food industry here in Manitoba. I believe that our future is incredibly bright, but we won't realize this future by accident. To realize our potential, we need to collaborate more broadly and more deeply than ever before. This includes connecting to people working at our universities and post-secondary institutions across the private sector, on the farm, and engaging people from outside the sector. We also need to consciously reach across disciplinary and sectoral boundaries to maximize the potential that we have here in Manitoba. It's a great time to be a Manitoban and a great time to be involved in the agri-food industry in the province of Manitoba. Thank you. And now I wanna leave you with a brief video that exemplifies the kind of collaboration that we have talked about with the University of Winnipeg and the EMILY Project. The intersection of equipment, technology, and crop science is at the core of a fundamental transition in Canadian production agriculture today. Machine learning will allow farmers to use less pesticide and less herbicide and have less of an impact on the environment. We're creating data specific to Manitoba so that we can make the important decisions that we need to make for the Canadian food supply chain. A person in their garden in their backyard, because the garden's small, can really go around and with precision pick individual weeds or snip off a leaf that has rust on it. You can extend that to something on the size of a field and um, apply that same precision and that same care on a plant-by-plant -plant basis to an entire Canadian prairie farm. This work benefits our students, it benefits our professors. I've never met a curious mind yet that doesn't want to do something that has impact and by connecting to the people that will ultimately use the innovations, it's a win-win for everybody. We know that the University of Winnipeg Emily Project is innovative and that through it, the digital ag ecosystem will grow and digital ag innovation will be fueled here on the Canadian prairies. Thanks, Ray. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Brooks White. Brooks is a producer in southwestern Manitoba from his farm called Borderland Agriculture. Brooks is a fifth generation farmer and he and his wife, Jen, uh, were also named uh, in 2018, uh, Manitoba's Outstanding Young Farmers. Welcome, Brooks. Hi, uh, my name is Brooks White. I am the owner 
along with my wife, Jan, and our two kids of Borderland Agriculture. We are a fifth generation farm and we're located in Pearson, Manitoba. For those of you that don't know, Pearson's in the extreme southwest corner of Manitoba. Um, so our farm is located, as I said, near Pearson. And we're a mixed farm and we are about 5,000 acres in our total land base. Now about 3,000 of that is in annual cropland and the other 2,000 is in perennials. Uh, we're mixed, uh, diverse farm with our cropping enterprises and bison is our main livestock operation. But dad in the top right hand corner here, technically retired, but he's still an important part of our operation. And in the bottom, our team, or as my wife likes to call them, our family, because they're more than just a team to us, they're part of our family. I came back to the farm after I graduated the U of M. 1999 was my first year of farming, and this was the result of that. So we've had three years since I started farming of excessive moisture, allowing zero acres on our farm to be seeded. This photo here was actually in 2011. Um, this is what I call my light bulb moment that uh, has brought about some change in the way we farm. Um, when I saw this photo in 2011, I kind of realized what was happening. On the top of the screen, you can see all the water from overland flooding, just from excessive rainfall we had that spring. On the bottom, there's a perennial field, and you can see there's almost no water in that perennial field. And we kind of realized, you know, it's all about a living plant, about how to get that water into the soil. We don't need to think about draining it. We need to think about ways of getting the water into our soil and utilizing it. So I had a new view on agriculture. I took that conventional mindset that we used to have and kind of started seeing things a little differently. It took quite a few years to piece all the, you know, the pieces of the puzzle together, but we started to get that clear view of where we're going now. We kind of realized there had been a degenerative agricultural system in the past. My dad was a real pioneer in sustainable farming and he turned to zero till in the early 1980s. And, but we realized, you know, our farm and our land, it really wasn't improving in all those years Dad had been a zero till farmer. Um, it wasn't until we started to implement what we call regenerative practices that we started to see an improvement in our soil and also in the ecology around the farm. There's five core principles to what we call regenerative agriculture. And the first and probably the most important being no tillage. You can see in this photo here, we're seeding directly into the previous crop. You won't find black tilled soil on our farm. Keeping your soil covered, it's another principle that relates to no tillage. We leave all that previous crop residue on top of the soil. This keeps an armor to protect our soil from erosion. Embracing plant diversity by growing a number of different annual crops, up to 12 different crops we grow in a given year. Plus our perennials are always a variety of species. And we maintain a living plant root as long as we can through the year. So we try to always keep something growing from all the frost free days in the spring, right through to the latest day we can in the fall. We like to try to keep something growing. Here you can see a seeding into what we call a cover crop in the fall. So we grew a, a green cover crop strictly for feeding the soil and seeded the next crop directly into it. And we integrate livestock as much as possible throughout our farm. This is the key component we were missing until I brought bison into our operation. I like to talk about water infiltration a lot. This is one of the main, uh, main benefits we see from regenerative agriculture is benefiting both the water and the carbon cycles. Um, these photos are taken in June of 2019. And by the power of observation, we've noticed these things over the year, years. And you can see in the top two photos, uh, just natural waterways, but we had two very dry years followed by our first rainfall event in June. So this was after two dry years, we get our first rainfall event, which was only an inch of a hard rain, but it came fast, you know, in 10 minutes, we had an inch of rain. And on the top two pictures, you can see neighboring fields, they aren't mine. You can see the amount of water that's laying out in those fields. On the bottom was our field that was directly across the road. I stood in the same spot on the road and took three different photos. And on the bottom, by implementing these regenerative practices, you can see there's no water laying in the field. We had absorbed all that water, infiltrated it as we're supposed to. Rather than thinking about draining all those waterways, instead, we need to think about getting that water into our soil where we can use it and grow crops with it. 
One of the best ways for getting water infiltration is by including perennials in our land base. But we've also observed perennials alone are not enough. You see a severely overgrazed pasture in the top and on the bottom. And you'll notice on the bottom, on that severely overgrazed pasture, we're looking at water laying, same as in the cropland. Grass isn't enough. It's about the management of the grassland as well. October 2019, after following a devastating fall with excessive moisture again, you'll see a pasture land. This is grassland. You can see the cattle in the background. You can see all the water. This is the end of October. You'll see a little bit of snow in the photo. All the water on a grassland. Perennials aren't enough to absorb the water. It's the management. This is a drone photo. And as I scroll the drone from this side of the road directly to the other side of the road, this is the grassland that we manage. There's zero water laying on it. All of the water was absorbed into the ground. You'll see a little bit of snow. That's not water laying, that's snow in the background. We utilize our bison as much as we can in what we call our Graze 365 program. We try to keep these bison out of the land, grazing year round instead of having to feed them and uh, supplement them in any way. They're made to be out grazing. So we grow our crops accordingly and we plan for it. Our grazing program is what I would I could compare it to precision agriculture for grazing. Essentially, we're creating a map for the year of where these animals are going to be on specific dates. And each one of these paddocks is planned with a different crop, a different species, depending on what it's going to be. And in a different year, it'll be a different plan to keep things mixed up and keep the diversity happening. So some of these paddocks are annual forage. Some of them are perennial, which will stay as perennial, but be grazed at a different time. The animals are only in any of these paddocks for a specific set period of time, and they're moved on, sometimes every day. So that we can plan for even periods like right now, in March, where the bison can be out on the land grazing stockpiled forage that was grown the year before. And we know where they're going to be and what they're going to be eating on a specific date. We utilize electric fencing to move them as frequently as possible. Our idea is to not remove all of the forage, but to leave half of it there to feed the soil as the soil is alive and needs food as well. So we utilize the bison as a grazing tool, mimicking what they did in nature. They go in, they graze and they trample half and they leave it behind for the soil. And that stimulates the soil and the grass to grow back rapidly and have a rest period where they don't come back to that paddock for a set period of time until later in the year. And we like to have fun while we're doing it. We make this a family event. We can go out, we can move temporary fence and we can have some fun at the same time. We utilize what we call cover crops. These are annu usually annual species, but not always, but we utilize them in a diverse way. So we'll seed many species together up to 25 at times. This particular one is a five species mix, a fairly simple one. We grow this crop specifically to feed the livestock, but also to feed the soil and stimulate the biology in their soil to get it functioning properly again. We have a planned uh, grazing pattern, moving the bison every day, utilizing those same strategies I said before about moving them, leaving half behind to feed the soil, flattening the other half. Utilize electric fencing, a single strand of electric fence can be used to move bison once they're trained properly. And immediately we start seeing the beneficial insects returning to our landscape. These are uh, all beneficials here. The orange one is a dung beetle that consumes the manure and cycles the nutrients fast and puts it back into the soil. Within weeks, we see the grass starting to grow back through the manure, breaking it down, feeding the biology in the soil. Immediately, we see soil structure improve, aggregation improves. We see the biology in the soil with earthworms, earthworm channels all the way down into the deep subsoil, immediately functioning within the first year of doing this strategy. And with the, of implementing these practices, we start growing annual crops for food production with zero added inputs, such as this one. And after years of practice, this is uh, this photo is after 14 years of practice, we can turn degraded, essentially dead soil on the right 
into the carbon rich soil on the left. And we can see benefits coming in other ways in our uh, above ground biology, our insects, our pollinators, so much so that we've had to start becoming beekeepers to take benefit of all these beneficials that we're seeing back around again, adding more value to the farm. And the wildlife that's returned to the farm in other ways is immense. And uh, it's, it's one real true measure of success. We see pheasants returning to our landscape that we haven't had in a long time. We also utilize these practices in our cropping enterprises other than just our grazing. We use what's called intercropping. This is a strategy where we grow more than one crop together at the same time, mixed together in the same field. We harvest them together and then we separate those crops for market. One example is peas and canola. We seed them together. We call it peola. It has lots of benefits where we're able to reduce our need for fertilizers, for insecticides and any other pesticides. It just makes for a nice ecosystem that naturally fights off all those pests. We separate it, we sell the peas and we sell the canola. Another example is our corn. And this is a hairy vetch crop that we grow underneath the corn. So we harvest the corn for grain and then the bison come in after the grain harvest and they graze that hairy vetch crop that's growing underneath. This is a winter feed source for them. So like I said, we can keep our bison out there and doing what they're supposed to be doing instead of being in a feedlot where we're tending to them. Like I said, bison are natural winter grazers. So we want to utilize that as much as possible. There's no reason why we can't grow our feed and store it out in the field and have them do the work. We like to share what we do, our practices on the farm. We also like to measure those results. We do this with certain tours. Obviously we can't do that the last couple of years, but we invite people to come to our farm when it is safe to do so and learn about these practices and how these can be implemented on larger scale. This is my son Sawyer and my daughter Piper, teaching them about what we're trying to do out on the landscape as well. And it's all about our end product. Our end product is a lean, flavorful red meat. Bison is our, our goal. Um, what we found in implementing these practices is our products don't necessarily fit in to the traditional commodity markets. As we develop these regenerative practices, there's people looking for these products and we've had to start our own brand and marketing a regeneratively raised product. So we started our own brand, as I said, we deliver into Winnipeg once a week, home delivery of our meat boxes. We also have several partners in Winnipeg, such as Crampton's Market, and very soon, all the Vita Health stores will be carrying our bison meat as well, as well as other meat shops around Winnipeg. Please go to any of the meat shops and ask for our product by name. And remember this summer, every Wednesday is bison hump day. So please treat yourself to bison, support the farmers that are raising uh, our products in such a way that we're benefiting the environment as well. This is a NASA supercomputer model and it's available in video format. However, for this purpose, I've taken some still photos to, uh, to share it. If you look on the dates for February 2nd right now, and what we're looking at is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So you can look in the Northern Hemisphere, what we're looking for is red and purple being the excessive levels of carbon. Um, so as of February 2nd, you can see what we're seeing happening in the Northern Hemisphere with a little bit of red showing up. As we progress through the year, I'll show you a few other photos of what's happening. When we get into May 1st, you can see how much carbon dioxide is now in the Northern Hemisphere. And you think about what's happening at this time of the year in agriculture. This is when farmers are out on the land and traditionally, they're tilling the land. What that's doing is releasing carbon up into the atmosphere. What we see happening as the season goes on, as we get into June, we start seeing those levels come back down again. This is a natural process. As plants start growing, they're starting to absorb that carbon out of the, out of the air and putting it through the plants and into the soil where that carbon belongs. So they're putting it back in as we see what happens later on in the season, when we hit July at maximum growth potential on those plants, a lot of that carbon has been put back into the soil and being stored there. 
This continues on throughout the year, right into the late fall until we start seeing the cycle start all over again in the next spring. So if you think about it, the more we can keep those living plants growing throughout the year, the more of that carbon we can be drawing down and putting back in the soil long-term. And if we don't till that soil, we can store it there without releasing it in that year. And if you think about these regenerative practices being the model for that, what we really need to do is learn how to promote these practices to farmers on scale and try to have a positive impact on our farm level as a community. I'd like to thank you for listening to my story today. And I'd just like to close with saying success is not always what you see. Um, sometimes you got to think outside the box, but for us, we got to look inside the soil. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brooks. Thanks to your whole family for participating. It certainly is a pleasure to have and hear your story. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today is a celebration. It's a celebration of agriculture and celebrating dedication, hard work, ingenuity, nimbleness, practicality, forward thinking. Those are the traits of our farmers, our food processors, our academia, our industry, our service providers, the whole ag value chain. Thank you all for your continued contribution to make sure our industry is resilient and that it advances. I'd like to invite you to join us again at 1145, where there'll be a virtual recipe demonstration hosted by the Farm and Food Discovery Center with Getty Stewart. Getty will be preparing a taco featuring plant protein and Manitoba bison from Borderland Egg. As you prepare this delicious recipe, you'll not only learn more about our agriculture industry, but also about the protein research that's currently taking place in Manitoba. I'd also like to encourage you to explore Manitoba Agriculture and Food Knowledge Exchange website. There's where we share research that is shaping agriculture and food production in Manitoba, as well as around the world. I'd like to conclude by thanking um, all of our speakers today and having them join us, the Premier, our Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Liberal Party, Dominic, Ray, and, um, and Brooks. Thanks very much. And we're gonna end with a video from Borderland Ag about Regen Agriculture. So thanks and mark your calendar for Tuesday, March the 15th, 2022 for our next Ag Awareness Day. Take care and stay well. We set a vision statement for our farm and it is regenerate. And what that essentially means is we've adopted regenerative agriculture taking it past a level of sustainability to a level of improving soil, working with nature in any way we can. I think there's so many opportunities to grow more food on the same amount of acres, but ultimately I'm a sunlight harvester. And everything we do in our farm needs to be thought of in a way of how much sunlight can we capture and convert that into nutrient dense food.